Good morning, Facebook Live. This is Robin Carvigato. It might be the afternoon for some of you. Welcome today as we finish, and I keep looking like this because I'm doing my progressives. Welcome today as we finish the last part of spiritual abuse. I am so excited because this has been an awesome journey. I have gotten a few messages about people that have watched this spiritual abuse series and they have been so blessed and if this series just blesses one person that is how much the lord loves you that just for that one person god loves you so much that he had me do this broadcast series on spiritual abuse just for one person even one amen hey katie higgum thank you for joining in so good to see you lady and I'm going to clean these really quick before we get started. And then we will also get into prayer. And I just cannot wait because this is going to be one of my favorite messages that we are going to end with. Hey, Kim Mitchell. So good to see you on here. Thank you for joining in. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much. And I am pulling up scripture right now to make sure that I have it ready for you all. Oh my goodness, it is going to be super awesome. Super, super awesome. Let me get to, hold on, the actual chapter of the book. We're going to get into Zechariah. Hey, Patricia, I'm, play, I'm praying for your recovery, sister. Love you. Thank you for joining in. And we're going to get into such an awesome, awesome, awesome scripture. Let me just go ahead and pull up Bible Gateway. And get the Hebrew ready. Hey, Janice, God bless you. Thank you for joining in. So good to see you. And we will have the Hebrew ready. And it is going to be phenomenal. That's all I can say. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. Like That is my favorite word right now. With this teaching series, God wants you blessed. Hey, Debbie Hawkins, I so love you. So good to have you on here. And as the other people join on, we will go ahead. Hey, Liz Rodriguez, I love you. Thank you for joining in. We will go ahead and enter into this broadcast in prayer. And let me get comfortable because I can tell it's going to be an amazing broadcast. And who knows how much I will be sitting all over this couch to get into this screen to bring this message of truth. Amen. God, we welcome your truth. Hallelujah. We welcome your truth within our members and we thank you for the power of Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, and that God, you are that clay maker. You are the molder of the clay, and we submit on the potter's wheel as you mold us and make us into the image of your truth, and you bring it within our members. And God, let there be some pruning today. Let there be freedom. Let the truth of your power come inside of our body and deliver us, hallelujah, where we know the truth and the truth sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited because I know when Holy Spirit brings you the truth, it will set you free. And understand, I know it is not me. Okay, I am just a yielded vessel who's crazy enough to totally be persuaded that I am hearing God and I'm bringing messages, which is what I absolutely love when I think about the particular minister, A.W. Tozier. A.W. Tozier. Hey, Barbara Voigt, I love you. Hey, Lisa. A.W. Tozier said, a true minister, basically, and I'm summarizing it, a true minister of the gospel brings God's word every time. And every time they bring the message, they know that their reputation is on the line. They're prepared for persecution. And they think nothing of the persecution that is to come. That's a minister who doesn't water down truth, but that doesn't care about the possibility of losing finances from the church, the possibility of losing 
a fan club, and you shouldn't have a fan club anyway if you're a true minister of the gospel, amen, because you're only lifting up Jesus Christ, and he's the one who's famous, not us, amen. And a true minister of the gospel is not going to hold back in saving their reputation and having people hate them or say bad things about them. And that is what this series is all about. Because I can tell you, since I have been doing this series, the persecution has been ramped up. <laughs> And people are not happy, and that is totally fine with me because I'm all about one thing, pleasing the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ, my Savior, and witnessing by the power of Holy Spirit of the testimony of Jesus Christ, which comes from the Father, amen? And I say all of that because I am certain that this message is going to encourage you. It is going to strengthen you. It is going to stir up 1 Corinthians 2 for holy emotions as you hear the word of truth and Holy Spirit unfolds that word of truth to stir your inner man up with the power of God's might, Ephesians 3, 16, so that you are rooted deep, grounded securely in the love of Christ to know one thing, God the Father, okay? Jesus came to interpret the Father. And those that are in a place of spiritual abuse, as we do this last broadcast, broadcast number five, on spiritual abuse, the emphasis is going to be that you know the interpretation of the Father. The interpretation of the Father and the reason that I bring that up is because those that persecute, and again, in the text that we're looking at today, as in the other past broadcasts, you're going to see two people groups. You're going to see those that have bad fruit, Matthew 12, 33, you shall know a tree by its fruit. And you're going to see those that have good fruit. And those that have good fruit are the persecuted. Again, I've been saying for the past few years, especially as a megaphone over the last two years, that the persecuted church is the real church. The persecuted church is the real church. And if you're being persecuted, first and foremost, rejoice, as in Matthew 5, 8 through 10, that you are blessed for being persecuted for righteousness, for great is your reward in heaven. And when men revile you for what you're doing as a Christian for the gospel, oh my goodness, all I can tell you is you need to count yourself blessed and to count yourself part of the remnant, the real church. My concern is those that are not persecuted. That is my concern. And the reason it's my concern is because it could be, not that it is for certain, but it would make me consider to assess and evaluate, to examine whether or not I'm standing for truth. And the reason I say that is because those that stand for truth, you're persecuted. And again, as I've mentioned on other broadcasts, you necessarily do not even have to say a word. It is the fact that the truth has been operative inside of your members that the very presence of God is made known. Isaiah 60 verse 1, Arise and shine above this place of prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Shine! For your light has come, truth has come from God himself, and the glory of God, his thoughts and opinions have risen upon you. And God will bring nations to the brightness of that rising. And it's because you know you're absolutely nothing. 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul chose to know nothing, to have knowledge of nothing, to make his persuasion of being known of nothing 
except for one thing, Christ Jesus and him crucified. And as I have been in this book, Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ, and I am truly seeing the transformed mind, the evidence of us walking in that 1 Corinthians 2.16, Mind of Christ, the evidence is that we are nothing. Like John the Baptist said in John 3, as he was around his disciples, his disciples are having a mood, a selfish mood. A bad mood and the reason that they're in a bad mood is because Jesus is here and Jesus's disciples and Jesus are baptizing and they're jealous John the Baptist disciples are jealous and this is what John the Baptist says now I just had to bring it up just because I can just imagine I can just picture John the Baptist saying this and it absolutely blesses me every time I think about it as I taught this in 2014 in God's Firewall School of the Prophets with the book of Song of Solomon and physics and mathematics. It was absolutely phenomenal. So here, let's go to John 3. John 3. And let's look at, let's look at. Jesus with John the Baptist. Let me get to where John the Baptist says that I must decrease so he must increase. Verse 30. Well, verse verse 28. Verse 28. Verse 27. Verse 27 of John 3. And this is where John the Baptist is addressing his disciples and he is setting them straight in their mood. And he is telling them truth. And initially they're offended. And so he's speaking truth to let them know that he's to decrease. He's to be nothing because only one person alone is to have the attention of the world. And that is Christ Jesus. Amen. John 3 verse 27. John answered, a man can receive nothing he can claim nothing. He can take unto himself nothing. Now, if you're going to get anything from this broadcast today, do you see what God is already doing? Nothing, nothing, nothing. And we'll also read 1 Corinthians 2, 2 in just a minute. But nothing is who we are. Because when we are nothing, then Christ Jesus is everything. And that's why you need to rejoice about your persecution and about being now aware that you're not going to tolerate spiritual abuse. And you're going to have boundaries. And so it's helped in that benefit area to guard the anointing as I talk about it. And at his feet, that book that is on Amazon that I wrote in chapter 4 on boundaries and the whole purpose of boundaries. And I will tell you, listen... If you've been in spiritual abuse, that is a phenomenal book and it's worth getting just for chapter four. When I was in such a place of destitution in the late 1990s, after my divorce from the doctor, and I was a single mother with now one and six year old boys at the time, I was devastated. Had my world shook up like crazy, everything was being shaken in my life. And God was removing things that were of this world. Anything that came in my life that was of this world, He was just pulling it out from under me. And He was building and planting me so that the sure foundation of Jesus Christ alone would stand in my life. And I remember just being at the end of my rope, and I just was suicidal. I had had my plans of suicide. I had just was so depressed. And of course, God knows how to encourage and keep us. And I just hated the thought of my sons not having a mother. And God knew that that would be one of the things that would turn my mind away from that mental assault of just being so utterly distraught. And I remember one of the things that God did was bring Henry Cloud into Birmingham, Alabama. He did. He's been in a couple times into Birmingham. 
And he did a workshop, a conference, and it was all on boundaries. I was an outpatient psychotherapist, and I brought in Dr. Henry Cloud's tools. He's a psychologist that works at a hospital, and one of the things that he really establishes is boundaries. Now, his book is phenomenal. His workbooks are even greater. He has also a book on safe people, a workbook on safe people, and I had Dr. Henry Cloud's book, and I knew about boundaries, and it really was a rope of hope that saved my life. It just gave me strength, like that Ezekiel 37, verse 11, 10 and 11, that army that stands up as a great host. They say, our hope is cut off. We're devastated. We can't make it. And God says, I will bring you out of your grave. I was in a grave, and that's one of the things that spiritual abuse awakens you to when you come to the knowledge of having boundaries is that you've been in a grave you might be putting pictures up decorating it with plants but it doesn't matter how many things you decorate a tomb with it doesn't change the fact that it's still a tomb and that is when god showed me the message what's been your tomb will become the womb instead of death there will be life and it's a womb into the new season, which is life and life abundantly, which is your destiny. And so God had me start in the late 1990s individually and in group therapy. And I was brought in to teach on contract with other different therapeutic um, clinics throughout Birmingham Metro and really had become an expert on boundaries. Well, God had me do a totally different viewpoint on boundaries in the book At His Feet in chapter 4. And he showed me a whole different aspect than I learned from Dr. Henry Cloud. And showed me the purpose of boundaries is to protect the anointing. Boundaries protect. And they specifically protect the anointing. And he has me bring in Adam in the Garden of Eden. Where Adam was created... And God framed him with Eden. If you could picture a picture frame like this coaster. Imagine this is a picture frame. And inside of this is where man is. And so God framed man inside of Eden. And Eden means delight. So the purpose of delight, our purpose on this earth in the Father is to know that he delights in us. Where do we see this in scripture? When Jesus was baptized at the river Jordan and he comes up and Holy Spirit comes down on him as a dove, God the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I what? Delight. When you are framed in the delight of God, you know you're accepted in the beloved and so that is your safe place. That is the boundaries, your borders in which you are kept, in which you're protected. And one thing you learn, if you've been through spiritual abuse, you learn the place of delight, which is that Hebrews 4 rest. And it cannot be emphasized enough to know Hebrews 4, especially 12 through 16, over and over and over again, because that is going to be one of your core verses that will really take deep roots inside of the members of your mind and your body. And the expression of that truth will be made known by Holy Spirit, John 16, 13, who brings the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I say all of that leading up to this scripture, and I still need to get to the main text of today's message. So again, let's look at verse 28. Well, verse 27. John answered, a man can receive nothing. So again, the emphasis is nothing, nothing, nothing. We have to decrease. And as we become nothing, and the spiritual abuse that we have been in has gotten our eyes on Jesus Christ alone to where we become nothing. Do you know why I am so radical today? Thanks to spiritual abuse, thanks to persecution, it has turned to my good, it's worked to my benefit, 
and I know I'm absolutely nothing, so I can be bold as all get out because it's not me. I know I'm nothing, and I know Christ Jesus in me is everything. So let's get back to 27, John 3. John answered, John the Baptist, A man can receive nothing. He can claim nothing. He can take unto himself nothing except as it has been granted to him from heaven. A man must be content to receive the gift which is given from heaven. There is no other source. You yourselves are my witnesses. You personally bear me out that I stated, I am not the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. So one of the things you learn through this spiritual abuse, thank you, Jesus, in humility, which is what I learned really good. You are not God. You are not Holy Spirit. You are not Jesus. There is only one God. There is only one Spirit. There is only one Savior. And this is going to be your greatest benefit. It is going to fire you up in the baptism of Holy Spirit and fire Matthew 3, 11, and 12. And you're going to decrease all the more. And Holy Spirit is going to bring you a strength and establish you in the strength as you are absolutely nothing. Woo! Oh my goodness, I've already got chills by Holy Spirit. We still haven't finished this verse. John answered, a man can receive nothing. He can claim nothing. He can take unto himself nothing except that it's been granted to him from heaven. A man must be content to receive the gift which is given him from heaven. There is no other source. You yourselves are my witnesses. You personally bear me out that I stated I am not the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. But I have only been sent before him in advance of him to be his appointed forerunner, his messenger, his announcer. Oh my goodness. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. And this is what, hey Lisa, I love you. This is what I just can picture when I taught this in 2014. I just pictured it. That John the Baptist is just raptured. In his entire person. He's raptured at the voice of the bridegroom. And I can just see the delight that's operative inside of his person. As he is just caught in the delight of God. In this one verse. Amen. Verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. He's referring to Jesus Christ. But the groomsman. Now he's talking about himself. Stands by and listens to him. He listens to the bridegroom. He listens to him. Uh, listens to him and rejoices greatly and heartily on account of the bridegroom's voice. This then is my pleasure, my joy, and it is now complete. Oh my goodness, I have just got chills. Let's read this verse again because this is where God is going to get you to before today's broadcast is over. And we still haven't gotten into our main text today in Zechariah. This is, this is just the, uh, the diving board into today's message. And we still haven't even gotten to today's message. This is the diving board to launch us into today's message. So let's read verse 29 and we'll finish with verse 30 and we'll get into our main text hey ronnie bruce i love you brother so verse 29 john 3 and i'm reading out of the amplified classic he who has the bride is the bridegroom but the groomsman who stands by and listens to him rejoices greatly and heartily on account of the bridegroom's voice this then is my pleasure and joy, and it is now complete. Woo! He is saying, I'm in the delight of God. I'm in Eden. I'm reconciled to the Father. I am reconciled and know the interpretation of the Father through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. He must grow more prominent and I must grow less so. 
So let's look at John 118 and then we'll get to our main text because we have to get to that main text. Oh my goodness. I cannot wait to see all that God is going to bring out with this main text. So John 118 and one of my greatest scriptures that has gotten me through the darkest of times. God wants me, God's telling me that someone is in a really dark time right now. And he wants me to tell you John 1, 1 through 18. And it's been John 1, 1 through 18 that I read over and over and over for months that got me through some of my darkest times. And that is why I am so passionate about John 1, 18. So here's John 1, 18. Amen. No man has ever seen God at any time. The only unique son or the only begotten God who is in the bosom, the intimate presence of the father. He, Jesus, has declared him. Only the son of God has been in his bosom. He has revealed him. He has brought him out where he can be seen. He has interpreted him. He has made him known. So as you go through times of persecution, as you have gone through attacks that have assailed you all around, it has pushed you to the place of decreasing, of knowing the delight of God by the interpretation of Jesus Christ. Not your interpretation. Oh my goodness. Not anyone else's interpretation because in your members... As your body becomes your mind, and again, get my new book, Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ. It's coming out in July. You'll see it. Your body becomes the mind. Memories are stored in the body, in the subconscious even, in the body, neck down, at the receptor level of the a, a specific receptor. I don't want to get into it yet. And as memories unpack in this receptor, it becomes an emotion, and you you have emotions, and you don't know why you feel a certain way, and it's because it's memories that are locked within your body, and they are unpacking, and that turns into emotions, and so therefore, sometimes we misinterpret the Father because of past traumas, because of past abuse, because of past failed relationships, and what this attack is a persecution is it pushes you to get the interpretation of the father from one person alone and that is Jesus Christ and you decrease where your interpretation of the father is absolutely nothing except for what the interpretation of Jesus Christ is of the father and that is truth. That is light. That is accuracy. That is God's glory. Woo! Glory to God. John 1, 18 says that. Now let's, let me, now let me get, before we get to our main text, God still wants me to get to another scripture. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 2. That as you have the interpretation of truth within your members, this is what it does. And I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 2, 2 through 4. Amen. And then we'll get to our main text. For I resolve to know nothing. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. I resolve to know nothing, to be acquainted with nothing, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing, and be conscious of nothing among you except Jesus Christ the Messiah and Him crucified. And I was in a past state of weakness and fear and dread and great trembling after I'd come among you. And my language, my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, plausible words of wisdom. But they were a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and the power and the proof by the Spirit and power of God operating on me. And stirring in the minds of my hearers the most holy emotions, persuading them. Hey, Melanie, God bless you. So what happens when the spirit of truth, Holy Spirit, when truth is in your members and truth is speaking. And there are those that God has brought amongst you 
to hear the message of truth, it witnesses to them. It encourages, it edifies, it stirs them up. It brings them out of the tomb and they rejoice greatly too. And they're excited and they're celebrating the persecution of the word and the fact that they're being persecuted. Amen. Now we're going to go to our main text and we're going to shift to a viewpoint to see the harvest, the standing grain harvest of truth. Where do we see this in scripture? Mark 4. I'm going to go through it real fast. I get into it in great depth in the new book. So I'm going to go through it real fast for time's sake. Mark for the core parable of the sower of the seed. And that seed is what? The word. Jesus, the word, sows the seed. And the soil is our soul. It's our self-image. And so the seed grows in our self-image where our self-image is transformed. Our soul is transformed. A lot of people think of the soul and it's enigma. It's a mystery. So I liken it in my book all throughout to the self-image. That's more analogous, more comprehensible to the person to where they can understand. Okay, my soul is my self-image. So what is being transformed is my self-image to where I think better about myself. I see myself as the delight of God. I see the Father's love towards me. I interpret the Father. He loves me. I want to draw near to Him in repentance. He's drawing near to me. And so it just gives you an entirely different interpretation of the Father. And then after that parable, immediately a parable behind it in Mark 4, starting in the 20s, talks about a light coming into a room and it compares that light to measurement. And so that light, again, is a measuring instrument. It's truth. Light in Scripture, in a positive form, is always truth. And so the light is in the room and the light brings truth inside of the darkness and so immediately after that is another parable and it's about talking about how the seed grows and it says you go sleeping and the seed is planted and a shoot comes out and before you know it there's a standing grain harvest so truth comes upon the word truth causes the word to grow and it's a standing grain harvest when you've been in persecution, when you've been in spiritual abuse, it puts you by necessity. Let me say that again. It puts you by necessity on the Isaiah 35, 8 highway of holiness where there is no unclean thing, no beast that can go on that highway. It is only for the redeemed of the Lord. It puts you mock one into a standing grain harvest into the call being accelerated. Listen, and this is, oh my goodness. I'm, I thank you, Jesus, that you're bringing this to me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Because the people that persecuted me, I could tell at times in those eight years where I was around them, how they did feel bad, but they never repented. And then they would just roller coaster up and down. Robin's horrible. Robin's evil. Wait, Robin's good. It's almost like they would have this coming in and out of state into who I was in Christ Jesus. And I was even being allowed only by God's grace. It was a miracle. I was allowed to rotate as a teacher in that class that I was persecuted in later on after that persecution that I described at the beginning of this broadcast series, somehow, only God, allowed me to go into rotation with three other teachers into that class, and I was teaching, and this was one of the most advanced classes in this church, and I was just given favor <laughs> to teach to those that were persecuting me, okay? And I was forced by necessity. And there were seasoned ministers that had been seasoned. Amen, Lisa. 
seasoned decades. Get this, decades longer than me. And I was just now getting in ministry and my gift was making room for me. And these seasoned ministers, I went Mach 1 past them, past them. Because I was forced out of necessity on the highway of holiness, which is that Hebrews for rest, and no unclean thing. I was protected from the unclean because my thoughts were the Father's thoughts. I thought what He thought. I loved my enemies. I loved those who persecute me. And so I was lifted into a higher way of thinking, into the Father's thoughts, so unclean things could not come on that highway and hinder me. And I was accelerated Mach 1 past them that I would, I will even share this, that right before I left there and I had stopped teaching right at the end of my last teaching in that place, he said, that prophet said, the one that persecuted me the most and still persecutes me to this day, says I'm a false prophet. And that was back in 2011, the beginning of 2011 when I left, okay? This is what he said in front of everybody in the Sunday school room. And I think, I know it is only God alone. He, he was seasoned decades longer than I've been in ministry. He said in front of everybody, he said, Robin has surpassed us. She's gone past us. He acknowledged it. Do you know the enemy will acknowledge truth? Every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when you decrease, hallelujah, and Jesus Christ increases in you, the enemy will acknowledge the gift because it's not you. Woo! Hallelujah. It is Christ in you. That in front of the enemies, this is Psalm 23. Oh my goodness, I just had to get to Psalm 23 and we still are not to our main text. Help me, Jesus, get to our main text. Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. See, the anointing is all over me, even around my enemies, especially around my enemies. I'm in their presence and he anoints me with the anointing and my cup runs over that there is no denying the power of God that's operating in my life. Hallelujah. To all of you who are persecuting me, I am in front of you and I'm preaching and I'm teaching you. Oh my gosh. I just want to get up out of this apartment and I just want to run. Oh my goodness. So now let us look at Zechariah 10. We're finally getting to it. We're going to end today. What a phenomenal crescendo to end this broadcast series. Zechariah 10. So we're, I say all of that, all about Mark 4, all about the harvest to end with this broadcast series Talking about your harvest. Amen. Zechariah 10 verse 1. Ask of the Lord. And again, I've written a workbook of the Watchmen series, just like I did Tesla. So this might be the next Watchmen book out of the eight workbooks I've already written that will come out. So I've written a book, a Watchmen series book on the text I'm about to share with you. Zechariah 10. <clears throat> Scripture says, ask of the Lord rain. See, when you're in your persecution, you ask God for rain. Because there's about to be a torrential downpour. And you have to understand rain in this Hebrew word is not just a light rain. It is the same as in Joel 2 where he will send a rain <clears throat> Ask of the Lord of the harvest to send that rain. It is a torrential downpour. It is like a tsunami rain that's coming on the harvest. Amen. Ask of the Lord rain. <clears throat> and we can liken it to Elijah. 
<clears throat> in 1 Kings 17 through 18, those two chapters, where there's a drought. See, God will put you in a place where you're persecuted. Oh my gosh, I just want to run. Where they have a drought, and I have those dreams. I had several dreams that there was a drought there. There's, there was no water. In all the dreams that I had there, there was no running water. There were spider's webs in the showers in that church, in the dreams that I would have, and there was no running water. God will put you in a place that is in spiritual drought so that you will be like Elijah and you can see the rain because there's a hunger and thirst within your members and there is a necessity that you get the rain. I know, Lisa, I'm about to run. That you get the rain. Oh my God. Bless the Lord for persecution. Because it's given you a necessity for rain. For the harvest. Amen. Ask of the Lord rain in the time of the latter or spring rain. It is the Lord who makes lightnings which usher in the rain. And give men showers and grass to everyone in the field. So, Zechariah 10 starts out, and this is the premise. This is the premise verse about this whole chapter, and it is saying, get ready for harvest. And I'm about to show you what harvest looks like. And so, it's almost like if you're seeing an abstract research article in a science journal, it gives you the premise of the actual article this is the premise of what the harvest looks like in Zechariah 10. So let's go to verse 2. For the teraphim household idols have spoken vanity. And so now we're seeing those that are caught up. Amen. Good, Melanie. I love you. I pray for you, sister. So we see that those that are persecuting the truth, the remnant, and other people that God is now exposing vanity. He's exposing their idols, right? For the teraphim, the household idols, has spoken vanity, emptiness, falsity, and futility. And the diviners, now he's exposing that counterfeit, counterfeit spirit of divination of Python that has been prophesying in their midst, and they thought it was the Gitta prophecy. It's not the Gitta prophecy because, what's the, because of the fruit operating within their members, understand that the power of the gift of Holy Spirit is operative in your members by the power source of love and on good fruit. Holy Spirit is not going to operate on bad fruit. That is not going to be Holy Spirit. Now, divination will operate on bad fruit. And that's what's being addressed. And the diviners have seen a lie, and the dreamers have told false dreams. So all the false counterfeit spirits, the false anointing, the false anointing is being exposed by the person who's persecuted, not because they're pointing fingers, but simply because Psalm 23 says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy, and you anoint me, God, in their presence, and as you anoint me, hallelujah, you're exposing the counterfeit in them. Woo! Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. This teaching has to go viral. Verse, oh my, we're still trying to finish verse 2. For the terrible household idols have spoken vanity, emptiness, falsity, and futility, and the diviners have seen a lie. And the dreamers have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people go their way like sheep. They are afflicted and hurt. Now it's showing those that persecute are in a false anointing. And it's showing that the sheep of the house are afflicted. And they're hurt. They're persecuted by those in a false anointing. Therefore, the people go their way like sheep. They are afflicted and hurt because there is no shepherd. Verse 3, my anger is kindled against the shepherds. And now we see God's judgment coming to the house of God. 1 Peter four seventeen. my anger is kindled against the shepherds who are not true shepherds. And I will punish the goat leaders. And I will say this. 
one of the last dreams that I had before I left that place is I was coming down from the hill on the top of a house and I looked across at the bottom of that hill and there were those people that persecuted me and all of a sudden a wall of fire came all around me and it separated me from them and right beside them was a goat. Right beside them was a goat. Now listen to verse 3 again as I bring that dream. My anger is kindled against the shepherds who are not true shepherds, and I will punish the goat leaders. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as beautiful and majestic horse in battle. Oh my goodness. When God's judgment comes, it's a decision either for you or against you. And for those who have been persecuted, who have endured, who have been in his love, who have been in his rest, he's going to visit you. He's going to separate the sheep from the goat, and he is going to beautify you and make the power of his word, his truth, inside of your members like a majestic battle horse, God's war horse. And I'll post that first war horse message from Judges 4 today when I preached it, 2011, at a farm, which by the way, the goats came up to the fence to hear me preach. Even Matthew saw them. The goats came up to the fence to hear me preach. That's what was happening. That was the time when I left that church. The goats were coming to hear me preach in the natural and in the spirit. Woo! Amen. Let's read verse 3 again. My anger is kindled against the shepherds who are not true shepherds, and I will punish the goat leaders, for the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and I will make them as his beautiful and majestic horse in battle. Out of him, Judah, prophesying of Jesus, shall come forth the cornerstone. Out of him, the tent peg. Out of him, the battle bow. Every ruler shall proceed from him. Jesus in you. You've decreased. He's increased. I know, Andre. I want to run, sister. I might run down to your place in Calera. Verse 5. And they shall be like mighty men, treading down their enemies in the mires of the streets in the battle. And they shall fight because the Lord is with them. And the oppressors riders on horses shall be confounded and put to shame. Do you see this, saints of God? That God is going to work all things to your good. That what doesn't kill you <laughs> makes you stronger. And instead, you've decreased. Christ Jesus has increased in you. The Lord of hosts, Psalm 24, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. That spiritual abuse, that persecution is to work that in your members. Who has not lifted his heart up to an idol nor sworn by his lips anything false. The separation of the sheep from the goat unto this generation, that this is the generation that will seek my face, unto this generation, he shall reward them with righteousness from the Lord God of their salvation. Open up, you ancient gates. Open up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty in battle. So the Lord of hosts, you see it all through Scripture. That's who visited Isaiah in Isaiah 6. That's who visited Gideon. That's who visited Joshua. That's who visited Paul on the road to Damascus. Whenever you see the Lord of hosts, it's always, always, always about the message. When you have been decreased in the place of persecution and Christ Jesus increases in you, you carry the message of truth as a battle like the Lord of hosts, that battles against darkness. It's Isaiah 
11, 3 through 5, prophecy of Messiah after the verse 2 of sevenfold dimension of Holy Spirit, that God will make him of quick understanding of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by his eyes or his hearing in the flesh, but with righteousness he shall judge and distribute equity to the poor, to the downtrodden, and he shall have the rod of truth and smite the oppressor, and by the breath of his lips he will slay wickedness. As we decrease, as we're persecuted, as the anointing increases in our person, the power of the message of truth, it battles darkness. And it pulls people out of darkness and into God's marvelous lights because of you knowing that you are His delight. God delights in you. Amen. And so this is where we're going to end. Job 39. I think it's Job 39. Let me get to it. I'm almost positive it's Job 39. Let me get to it. Thank you, Jesus. As we end, as we end this broadcast, amen. Yes, it is Job 20. It is Job 39. And this is the majestic battle horse, amen. Here it is. Have you, verse 19, Job 39, have you given the horse his might? And this is, this is the revelation of the Lord's coming forth and this is the power of Holy Spirit being made known let me read verses 17 and 18 to lead up to this because you're going to see that the horse the horse is filled with wisdom God's wisdom amen Job 39 verse 18 yet when she lifts herself up in flight she can laugh to scorn the horse and rider Oh, verse, verse 17. For God has deprived her of wisdom. Neither has he imparted to her understanding. So before this, we see God referencing the ostrich. And the ostrich in this chapter represents those that are hardened. In fact, let's just read the ostrich. So the ostrich would be the goat and the horse would be the sheep who are now majestic in the power of God. Let's look at verse 13. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly. So we're seeing that spirit of pride. But they are pinions and plumage. Uh, but are they the pinions and plumage of love? No. The ostrich leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust, forgetting that a foot may crush them or that the wild beasts may trample them. In other words, the ostrich is not caring for the young. Okay? And again, this is to liken those that are proud and haughty in a false anointing. She is a hard, she is hardened against her young, young ones, as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain because she has no sense of danger for her unborn. She's a hireling, John 10. For God has deprived her of wisdom, neither has he imparted to her understanding. That represents those that are hardened hearts whose love has grown cold and the hardness of their hearts keeps them from understanding truth. It keeps them from receiving wisdom so they want to keep on hitting back at everything around them and they do not give attention to those that are young in Christ that come in the midst of their ministry which is what happened to me. And instead, they want them to be trampled on. They are like prey, wide open to the adversary. And no one in the ministry is there to protect them because they're all bound up in pride. That is what Holy Spirit is showing. But now we're going to see the majestic horse. Amen. Verse 18. Yet when she lifts herself up in flight... So swift is she, she can laugh to scorn the horse and his rider. So we see the persecution of the ostrich with the horse. And then the next verse, it says, Have you given 
the horse his might. Have you clothed his neck with a quivering and shaking mane? Was it you, Job, who made him to leap like locusts? The majesty of his snorting nostrils tremble. He paws in the valley, in the place of persecution. He paws in the valley and exalts in strength. He goes out to meet the weapons of armed men. He mocks at fear and is not dismayed. This was me in the middle of that classroom as people were ostriches and trying to trample me. And I was in the Hebrews 4 bubble. I was laughing in their face. I was laughing in their face. I was the horse. Oh my goodness. Let me read verse 21 again. He paws in the valley and exalts in his strength. He goes out to meet weapons of armed men. He mocks at fear and is not dismayed or terrified. Neither does he turn back from battle, from the sword. The quiver rattles upon him, as does the glittering spear and the lance of the rider. He seems in running to devour the ground with all fierceness and rage. Neither can he stand still at the sound of the war trumpet. As often as the trumpet sounds, he says, Ha ha! And he smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Do you hear this, saints of God? Who is the trumpet? Jesus Christ, John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos, chapter 1, in that place of persecution. And Patmos means the place of my killing. That's what Patmos means in Greek. He was at the place of decreasing, and when he decreased, hallelujah, he heard Jesus, and Jesus' voice sounded like a war trumpet. And inside the members of John the Apostle, he trembled. Saints, all I can say <clears throat> is there is an anointing, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. That when I came amongst you, I came in fear and in trembling. Isaiah 66, 2. Who can build a house for me? But this is the one I will choose. He that is contrite and trembles at my word. Because they have a relationship with Jesus. A knowledge, a wisdom of him. As they've decreased and he's increased. Hallelujah. So they carry the message of truth. That is a trumpet in their members. And they speak that message to others. So that many will know the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They will come to the Father. They'll know wisdom. And they will know His light. Woo! His truth in Jesus' name. Amen. God, we thank you for this series. We thank you for truth, Father. We acknowledge your wisdom. We acknowledge the power of Holy Spirit. And we say yes and amen, Father, as you are equipping us as that majestic battle horse, that you are causing us to delight in truth. You are bringing us to the place of unity, Father, the place of unity as Ephesians 4, as your true church and yea, God, hallelujah, as we see your unity come forth, I just proclaim in verse 4 of Ephesians 4, there is one body, woo, hallelujah, one body, one church, hallelujah, there is one body, one spirit, just as there is also one hope that belongs to the calling we have received, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of us all, who is above all, who is sovereign over all, pervading and living in us all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. In Jesus' name, God bless you. I love you. I have enjoyed this broadcast. And please get these messages out. So many people need them. I love you. Have an awesome day. In Jesus' name.